trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Palen and with me in the studio is Isak Rauti. Hi Isak. Hi William. Almost looked at the camera. <laughs> Almost. Looked at you. Close. Close call. <laughs> Today we have a, an interesting guest once again, as we usually tend to have on this show. So welcome to the Soaked by Slush podcast, Filippe Botteri. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Great to, great to have you. Um, do you want to Tell the listeners uh, who you are and, and what you currently do. Sure. So I'm a partner with uh, Excel. So we are uh, a global venture firm. So we started about 35 years ago in Silicon Valley. So this is where we have our roots and, and culture, uh, doing early stage investments in technology companies uh, in Silicon Valley. And over time, we realized that uh, Silicon Valley did not, did not have the monopoly of innovation. So we opened... Uh, an office in London uh, in 2000, so 21 years ago. So we've been on the ground here, um, you know, for more than 20 years. And we also have an office in India. So today we are one of the very few early stage, um, you know, venture platform with a, a truly global uh, network and coverage. And, and this is is that network that we give to our portfolio company and, and hopefully give them a strong uh, competitive advantage. And, uh, you know, from... Um, a stage standpoint, so the core of the business is, you know, kind of seed, series A, early stage investments. Over time, we also have added growth capabilities. Um, so we have a global growth fund which can, you know, invest uh, at a later stage in the business. So anything from, you know, 40, 50 million dollars up to 100, 150 million dollars. Um, and, and the three key areas where we are investing overall is anything around the digital consumer, anything around fintech and online payments, and anything around um, you know cloud computing, SaaS analytics, and, and security, which is what we're going to um, talk about uh, today. So, so we have evolved into a full stack platform. So we do anything from seed to to late stage, and and we do that on a, a global basis. Yes. Can I also ask, uh, what is your background? What, uh, what do you do? Yeah, so I, I joined, um, and that, that I think ties nicely to, to this, um, this discussion. Um, so I, I joined Excel um, 10 years ago. Um, you know, before that, I spent about a bit less than 10 years in, in the Valley. So I was with another firm called Bessemer Venture Partners. Um, and before that, uh, I was with, uh, you know, with McKinsey, both in the Palo Alto office and I studied my career in, uh, with them in, in Europe, as you can guess from my accent and from the other side of the, the channel. So I was born and raised, uh, in France. Um, but I think what, so the, you know, the question is like, why did I move back from Silicon Valley to, to London in, um, you know, in 2011? And so I, I was um, kind of lucky to start in venture 15 years ago. So I was in 2006, uh, basically, which was at the, the beginning of cloud and SaaS. Like when I was starting in, in when I started in venture and in the valley, I think the world was, the question was like, is SaaS and cloud a fad, or is that is that really gonna gonna last? And I think I wrote my first blog post, which is you know why I disagree with. Tony Zingali, who was like a um, you know well-known CEO, he was CEO of uh, Mercury Interactive at the time, and basically he was doing a keynote at a conference saying that basically SaaS you know would disappear, uh, and so basically I wrote my first blog post saying, well, no, I think SaaS and cloud is actually the the future um, of software. So from 2006 to 2011, um, you know at Bessemer I helped build you know their cloud practice. Um, you know, invest in Gen 1 uh, SaaS companies like Cornerstone On Demand, Eloqua, Intact. Um, and in 2010, uh, I invested in a company called Criteo, uh, which was kind of the first big data play around uh, kind of online advertising, around retargeting. And it kind of opened my eyes about what was happening in Europe. I saw this great company out of France. Uh, they were growing from 5 to 15 million uh, in, in a year, and, and no one was really paying attention to it because no one was really looking at Europe. And then a year later, I, I just got the call from Excel, and I was like, "Wow, 
something seems to be happening in Europe. Like we're, we're seeing stuff there that, that, you know, shows that it's, it's starting to happen. Um, I wanted to be on a global platform. So I thought, you know, you know, if you want to build global businesses, you need to be global ourselves. So that was very important to me. And I really liked the, the, the team there. Um, so I made this, the, you know, the move back, pack my bag, uh, landed in, in London mid 2011. And then at the time I was like, well, a lot of what I did in, in Silicon Valley was around, you know, cloud computing and SaaS. But at the time, like 2011, 2012, 13 and 14, a lot of the action in Europe was around uh, the kind of the first generation marketplaces and, and consumer services, but not much was happening on, on, on the, the cloud front. So for the first three years, I, I invested in companies like, um, you know, Blablacar and, and Fiverr on, on the marketplace side. Uh, and I was still looking for these cloud companies. And I, the first one I, I found was uh, PeopleDoc in 2014. And then in 2015, I invested in, you know, Algolia and, and Dr. Lib and started to see that a new generation of founders was, you know, building these great cloud companies. Um, and then looking back in 2016, like seven out of 10 of our last uh, most recent deal that Excel was actually cloud company. And I was like, wow, something is changing now. And and we just need to, um, you know, we, we just need to tell it, you know, let's tell that to the world. Let's show that Europe can actually be a great ecosystem for, for cloud company. Uh, and that was the birth of the Excel Euroscape. So we did the first version in 2016, which was kind of this overview of where, um, you know, the state of the cloud for, for Europe. Uh, and, and, you know, we kind of added, uh, you know, including the list of what we think were, you know, kind of the, the top 100 um cloud companies out of europe um at the time and um you know when you compare the number of where we were in 2016 and where you are today it is just night and day right i mean and just show how much the ecosystem has accelerated um just i mean just give you a couple of stats i mean in 2016 there was like around like a billion dollar invested in the entire cloud ecosystem in Europe for the year, right? In 2021, the largest round, which was uh, Celonis, was in Europe, was a billion dollar. So, you know, in, in basically five years, went to all the money invested in the entire ecosystem to just one deal. And, and the one billion became like 30 billion, you know, year to date in 2021. So, yeah, really alert, like how, the, the difference that, isn't inflation. Yeah, I mean, it was been a steep inflation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah, but you mentioned the Axel Euroscape. Uh, it's a report or whatever you want to call it, like a, like an overview of a lot of the sort of um, data and 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 related to these these things. And you've just actually released the 2021 version of this Axel Euroscape uh, on the 19th of October. It's it's uh, available online. I think we're going to put the link somewhere in the description so people the the listeners can go read it. But um, yeah. Should we go through it? There's a lot of interesting stuff in in the in the the text here. Yeah, start- and and maybe just to to give some, some um, you know some background around the, the acceleration that we're seeing certainly um, uh, around you know cloud. I think in Europe, but also globally. Uh, and then we'll we'll compare later in the discussion. You know how does Europe perform against the U.S. But overall, um, I mean, if you think about the market, there is roughly you know, half a trillion dollar or a bit more of software spends. And and you could say that, you know, barely yeah, less than probably one third of that today has migrated to the cloud. Um, so there's still, you know, if you look at the this migration from on-prem software to um to cloud, we're still at still the very early innings of that um of that transformation. So this trend is not something where we're saying, wow, you know, we are at the top of the S curve and most of the the workload have uh, have moved to the cloud. No, we're still at the very beginning. And I think that's why you're seeing this, you know, this very long trend, like very deep trend, um, still, um, you know, pushing a lot of this public and and private company uh, overall. I think if you look at the, the public side, I think what's interesting is that today you have basically 10 software companies 
that are worth north of a hundred billion dollar in um, in market cap. And, and out of this ten company, I mean, together they're worth around four billion, slightly more than four billion dollar. And more than half of this, you know, two point two billion, just one company. It's Microsoft. Sorry, do you, mean, my, uh, do you mean four trillion? I think you're trying to. Say- yeah, four trillion. Four trillion, yeah. yes, yes. Four trillion dollar. Yeah, right. correct. Uh, and, and Microsoft is, you know, is two point two, so slightly more than half of that in just mm-hmm. one company. And Microsoft had, has added in market cap six hundred billion dollar in the past year. This is more than the nine other companies combined. Uh, so clearly, Microsoft has been the big winner of um, you know this migration to to the cloud. And that's what explained their success, because in the past, um, you know, with, when Satya, you know, took the help of Microsoft, he really refocused the company uh, on Azure and Office 365 to really push all their workload to the cloud. And the numbers are there, you know, to prove that it was clearly right. And then on the other end, if you look at the only company in this 10 company whose market cap has declined in the past year, that's SAP. And why? Because, I mean, you can argue that, you know, their cloud migration has been totally unclear, right? And they haven't really been able to capitalize on this core trend that we're seeing uh, in, in the software ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm, I'm one happy Microsoft investor myself, uh, but it's, uh, it's very true. It seems like since this has been happening quite quite for a long time already, and it's easy also to kind of draw parallels between cloud computing and, and the whole you know, uh, growth of the internet and and platform economies and everything related to that. It seems like this has been going on for a long time. That we should be finished by now. That there should be no gas left. But as you said, there's there's so many companies that still haven't made the transition, and it, there's so many countries still coming online uh, in the coming years. It seems like this will be a massive advantage also for for Europe, for instance, now that is, uh, according at least to your report, it seems to, to be catching up quite quite well. Um, actually, one question I had bef- uh, before we dive deeper into the report, um, you had um, Europe and Israel kind of pulled together as one one area and then comparing that to the, to the US. Is there some uh, some specific reasons for for pooling Europe and Israel into like kind of one, one market uh, or what, what's the logic behind that? Well, I mean, we could call it the kind of Mediterranean region to some extent. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think we're including it because Israel has always been a very active market in terms of venture overall, and and so it's always for us been part of that our, our you know same ecosystem. And there are a lot of ties between the Israeli and European and U.S. ecosystem. So that's why I think we're you know including them in in, in this um, kind of in this same bucket. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, if we if we go back now to to 2016, uh, you mentioned the funding round uh, or the, the funding size of, of private money coming in um, that has grown massively. The market caps uh, seem to be growing. Uh, what other stats do you feel like are the most relevant to point out that uh, Europe is is indeed catching up now to the to the US in in terms of cloud computing? Well, I mean, I, I think when we look at the progress that Europe has made in the past five years. Um, I think the main question that, you know, I think uh, the ecosystem has earned the right to ask is, um, you know, are Europe and Israel on path to global dominance? Um, uh, Historically, Europe and Israel have always been considering the shadow of kind of the, the U.S. venture ecosystem. And you know, if you look back, um, you know, 10 years, um, it was all about the kind of the copycat and, and, and Europe trying to look at what were the successful internet or marketplaces, um, you know, in the US and, and try to copy that in Europe. I mean, that was a playbook of rocket internet, for example. So it was not about innovation. It was really about you know, let's try to copy and adapt to the local market what someone in the U.S. has done. Uh, and I think today we're very far from that. Uh, I think today Europe has really shown that it can create category leaders. It can really innovate and not just copy what what were what was happening in, in the U.S. Um, 
And if you look at some of um, you know a few facts here, um, if you take the largest cloud IPO in 2021, um, that was actually UiPath, um, which was a company company out of Romania. So Europe had the largest cloud IPO uh, this year. I mean, this is something like if we have told, if we have said like four or five years ago in 2016, like Europe is going to generate in five years from now the largest cloud IPO, uh, you know, no one would have believed it. Like it, it was just not meant to happen, and it is actually happening. Um, if you look at you know the fastest company to get to unicorn status. Uh, the number one is Wiz, which is a cloud security company out of Israel. The number one is Hopin, which is a virtual event company out of London. So two of the top three fastest cloud unicorns have, you know, are just coming from our region, right, in Europe and, and Israel. Um, and if you look at the, the top three funding rounds, um, I mean, historically, Europe has always been behind in terms of the size of the round, et cetera. And, and today, actually, yes, I mean, out of the top three, US has two. Uh, and, you know, the largest round was in that data breaks at 1.6 billion, and the largest in Europe was still on this at 1 billion. But overall, like, we're really catching up. Like, we're talking about billion dollar round, like, okay, it was 1.6, one, but it's still like it's massive round. And, and when you look at, on average, kind of the top rounds happening in the region, it's not that there is like, a big, um, a big difference. Um, so you start looking at these data and you say, wow, you know, a lot of very interesting things are um, actually happening in, um, in, in Europe. Now, the question is uh, quantity, right? <laughs> so if you look at the, um, the total amount uh, of, uh, you know, that has been invested, basically, yes, the US is still uh, still larger than, uh, than, than Europe. Uh, Europe is, you know, around 30 billion and it's about two thirds of the US, about 46 billion. So we're still doing a bit less. I think if you look at, uh, the number of, um, of IPOs as well, I mean, there was 21 IPO in the US, 11 in Europe. So, it, um, for this year on, on the cloud front. So overall, I think in volume, the U.S. is still uh, larger, but comparable. It's not that they're you know 10x larger, which was the case in 2016. Now you know we're kind of two third um, uh, uh, of, of the U.S. Um, but what's most important to me is basically the quality of um, you know of the outcome, right? And so if you look at the number of IPO, there are more IPO in the U.S. than uh, coming from Europe and Israel, but uh, actually, that number is growing much faster because, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the, last year, the 21 is a 30% increase in number of IPO for the U.S. versus 11 uh, is actually uh, close to 100% increase for, uh, for Europe and, and Israel. So, you know, it's growing faster. The amount raised in IPO is similar. The average market cap at IPO is similar. And the average revenue multiple of this company going public is also similar. Okay. So if you sorry, Philip. Yeah. Sorry, Philip. If you want a listener, if you want to uh, look at the report at the same time while you're, which parts should you be looking at right now on the report? Yeah. So right now we are, um, you know, I'm, um, you know, more specifically on the section about Europe and Israel and are they on the path to, to global, global dominance? Okay, right so here, on yes. slide um, 29. And so I would just, um, you know. Just saying that, yeah, in terms of volume, the U.S. is still in front, but in terms of quality of these public companies that are coming out of Europe, they are uh, actually very, uh, very similar. And, and, and if you look at the, um, you know, the private side and, and the unicorn, basically, the, you know, it, it's the same story. So there were 43 new unicorn out of Europe versus 74 in the U.S., but the median value of this unicorn is very similar. The median capital raised is similar. Uh, the number of unicorns um, that have raised big rounds, so north of $250 million is the same. And the time it takes on average to become a unicorn is similar. So basically what we are saying here is both on the public and the private side, 
things are very uh, comparable in terms of the quality of the company, the access to funding, et cetera. And so to me, I think that is the most um, important point because at the end of the day, it's all about creating these category leaders. That's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, it's fun because we've had this discussion, this conversation on this podcast before about Europe and the ecosystem and everything. So it's nice to have uh, in- interesting concrete data here to actually uh, demonstrate the the trends that we've been discussing in previous episodes. But actually to follow up on what uh, Will- William asked about the, the choice of sampling still, like I think about Europe and Israel. Now, okay, first of all, I understand that Europe isn't a country, whereas Israel is a country. So there might be some differences there. But uh, I guess the interesting follow-up to, to William's question would then be like, is is Israel making Europe look significantly better compared to the US? Or what is, uh, how, how do you think about that? Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question. So yeah, I mean, it, it, to me, it's interesting to put um, Israel in, uh, in, in, in context, right? Because um, what happened in this ecosystem? Like if we look at, you know, 2000, when we started in Europe, I think a lot of our, most of our investments were either in the UK, so in London, or they were in Israel, in Tel Aviv. So the Israeli ecosystem has been here for a um, you know, very long time. And I think what we've seen in the past 20 years is that Europe has moved from you know, kind of being bipolar around these two ecosystems to now being a combination of you know, 20 plus hubs and, and cities where we're seeing great, uh, great innovation. Uh, I mean, again, you know, five years ago, if you had said that Bucharest would generate the biggest uh, cloud IPO of 2021, like, you know, people will have raised uh, their eyebrows, right? But it, it actually happened and it showed that really innovation can come from anywhere um, in, in the region. And so basically what happened in, in the past 10, 20 years that, you know, all these hubs have evolved in um, um, uh, in Europe, but Israel, you know, has continued to evolve uh, as well, uh, and, and has been doing very well, right? I think you know you'll see uh, uh, basically a, a slide in the report saying that Israel is emerging as you know the unicorn cloud factory of, of the region, and it's true that if you look at the roughly eighty unicorn that we have in Europe and Israel, Israel is one third of it. And it's also one third of the new unicorn that that we're seeing um, that we saw in, in the past year, and and we look at an interesting statistic. Which I, I don't know how meaningful it is, but it's kind of interesting, which is to look at um, the unicorns per million people in the country, uh, and by far, like Israel is like super high at you know kind of two point nine. Uh, versus, you know, most European countries from the Nordics, France or Germany are like, you know, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3. Uh, so it, it's kind of um, an interesting stat to see, to show that actually Israel is kind of uh, an, an anomaly to some extent um, in, in kind of the unique, unicorn creation uh, world. But the, the question is, so what, what is happening in Israel? Like, what, what is this, um, the, the case? Um, to me, this is a combination of different things, right? I think the first one is that Israel has, um, you know, some very a lot of great talents, and the, the, the source of these talents is one, uh, the army and the 8200 units. So they're very strong. Um, basically, just like you think about the army as kind of sea, you know, lands uh, uh, and air. And they have like a fourth branch, which is kind of this digital cyber intelligence, um, et cetera. So this is a great source of, of talent. The other thing that happened is that um, given that the Israeli ecosystem has been around for a long time, has been great at, you know, uh, you know, especially in the security space and, and the, the, the software cloud space, there's been a lot of acquisition there. So all pretty much all the big U.S. technology company have made acquisitions in Israel, and therefore these acquisitions have evolved, you know, in the past 10, 15 years into kind of full-fledged uh, R&D and product center. Uh, and that's also a great source uh, of talent. So th- that's, I think, the first the first thing that happened is a like, great pool of talent in Israel. Um, the second thing is that these talents have the right skills you know, they have skills which really match 
the big underlying the big trends that we're seeing in in, uh, in tech like all these secular trends around um, you know cloud computing around security around infrastructure around payments these are all expertise that are very strong in, in Israel so when you combine these talents with uh, you know this secular shift and the great match I think it's um, you know it's very powerful um, combination. Uh, and then the third thing is that, you know, you have a lot of local seed funds, um, you know, that have been wanting to make like pretty big seeds. Uh, and, and so you can see a company out of Israel's raising like five, 10, $20 million seeds. So from the get go, they have, you know, very strong team with access to a lot of capital. Um, and then of course you have, you know, all the kind of the global funds, which are kind of coming as well to to um to invest the, the big round so all these combinations um you know together i think have led to really uh, uh great things for for israel yeah exactly that makes makes sense what what about in terms of of founders and, and operators you you mentioned that there's kind of a new generation building companies is the is it the same founders still building as in 2016 or has the morning porridge changed along the way? What What's different with, with this batch of companies? Well, I mean, I, I think the first thing is is quantity, right? I think you have a lot more people coming out of, uh, I mean, Europe has always had, you know, some very strong um, universities, especially around, um, you know, kind of, um, coding, I mean, computer science, but also around uh, data, an algorithm, which is, you know, which are great skills in, in the current world. Uh, but I think what we have seen also is a shift of uh, mentality. And, and, and now if you look at the number of students coming out of these schools who are interested into the, the startup world, I mean, it, it is now becoming the, you know, a dominant uh, majority, right? Because people, you know, they're less excited about working in, you know, in banking or consulting or some of the big industrial group. Like they're more excited uh, by, you know, working for, um, you know, for startups or actually starting their, their own startup. Um, so I think that's one thing around the, the talent pool is that, you know, it's really, uh, it's really been growing exponentially. Um, and, and the second thing is that the level of ambition now, I think, um, is uh, you know is really unprecedented. Like all um, all the founders, um, they want to be they want to be global. Um, you know they want to build category leaders, uh, and, and so it's um, you know I, I think for me um, that's been it's been very exciting to be in this ecosystem and be able to meet every day several of these founders and to see their uh, their energy and, and commitment to to creating um, these great companies. Exactly. Do you think it's uh, you mentioned in your report that the the um, the world is or the, the world of cloud at least is, is now uh, flat? So you think we are already at the point that it's you have a similar chance of, of succeeding regardless of where you're based uh, in terms of being based in in, in the US or in, in Europe or Israel? Uh, correct. I mean, I, I think the. Um well, one thing which is uh, uh, which is clear is that at some point, if you want to be, if you're selling into enterprise um, uh, software, like selling to uh, an enterprise company, you um, you probably you you know your your largest market is going to be the U.S. Because for a dollar spent in software, fifty cents is actually spent in the U.S. Um, so you need you only at some point to develop your go to market there, but. In terms of uh, engineering and products, I think Europe and Israel are very attractive places uh, because to some extent there is, you know, less competition for talent than in. I mean, everything is related, right? Everybody, every entrepreneur I speak to will, will tell you that hiring is hard. But I would say that you know, look at um, Silicon Valley and the concentration around San Francisco. When you look at Europe, where you have actually 20 different hubs. Um, you know, you can you have access to actually a broad uh, pool of talent, um, and, and it's probably easier to build that great product team um, in Europe uh, today uh, for for all of these uh, reasons. So now, at some point, you need to go and build your go to market in the U.S. But from a product and engineering standpoint, it's very interesting, and that's why also we're seeing uh, a lot of um, uh, U.S. companies you know making acquisition 
in um, you know in Europe to actually have access to uh, to this talent pool. And then there's uh, I guess the final part of your uh, your escape 2021 maps out six uh, future trends. We don't have to go through all of them if you don't uh, feel like it right now. But like, what would you highlight? Which ones would you highlight from this uh, this trend uh, list of trends here that you see in 2022 and onwards? I mean, I, I think to me, if um, you know, I wanted to um, you know to, to flag three of them, I would say that. You know, the thing, the, the number one, and this one we flagged in, in last year as well, but it's really uh, the importance uh, of uh, automation uh, for, for the enterprise. And what we're seeing right now is that uh, with AI becoming more performant, the number of use cases that you can automate increases because with AI, you can automate a lot, you know, workflow that are a lot more sophisticated. Uh, and so what's been very interesting is that with time, you're seeing that the potential uh, to automate processes in the enterprise is actually growing. And I think this is a trend and, and it will keep growing uh, you know, for a long time, I think, because it just feels that we are at the very early innings. Um, so you see company you know, like um, you know, UiPath and, and Celonis, uh, and Genesis, like all the, this new generation of, of companies which help automate this enterprise um uh tasks and, and workflow are becoming more and more efficient and and that is um you know very exciting um now if you look at um you know the second trend that i wanted to to, to flag here it's um security uh focusing on cloud like cloud security feels like it's a very um uh, long-lasting and exciting trends and why is that i mean i think um Historically, uh, all the workloads and a lot of the workload are still on-prem, right? But when, when your workload is on-prem, you have a specific set of security parameter, right? Because you control, uh, you know, you have your, your, your hardware and then you install your app and you need to configure it. But it, it is, a, to some extent, more simple environment. When you move to cloud, suddenly everything becomes virtual and your infrastructure becomes code, right? Because it's all about how you code the different instances on, on AWS and, and start this application, et cetera. Uh, and so as your infrastructure becomes code, the level and the number of vulnerabilities and the challenge of securing that infrastructure are very different. Um, and, and, and you need to do it with a focus on code, but you need to do it also with a, a focus on configurations. Um, and so we're as more and more workloads are migrating to the cloud, we're seeing actually, uh, you know, that super increasing number um, of, uh, you know, of challenges and, you know, leading to the rise of the next generation of cloud security company, like, you know, we mentioned Wiz and, and Snick and, and, and a few others. So that's, I think, the, the third one. And, and the fourth one, uh, which is also quite uh, exciting for me, and this is something which is new in the Euroscape this year, is we have added um, you know, a section in our top 100 around crypto. Uh, and, and why is that? Because I think this year we have really reached a tipping point, uh, tipping point for crypto, where basically we are seeing it being starting to be part of the financial um, infrastructure. Uh, and we're seeing all the, you know, asset custodian, all the banks, et cetera, getting, you know, I mean, to provide their customer the ability to, you know, buy and hold and trade these cryptocurrencies. And, uh, and they're building, so you, you have a need for a new infrastructure layer uh, for all these financial institutions to be able to operate uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, and, and to me, that's super interesting because it's like, you know, I describe crypto today as probably as, I would say the internet uh, in the early 90s. Uh, so this is just, I think, the the, the beginning, um, and there is a real need for all this, you know, core building block for the crypto infrastructure. You know, Chainalysis is one of them on on the the compliance side, and got a few of fire blocks on the custodian side, and, and um, Nansen on on the data side. So. It's been very interesting to see um, this ecosystem develop in, in, in the past year. 
This is music to your ears, William, isn't it? <laughs> yes. No, but yeah, I agree. It's uh, it's definitely a trend to, to watch out, and it's very, very early. Uh, it, I think it's good to compare it to the early internet, but the only thing uh, that differs is the amount of users at the same point in time, which is where crypto is, is way ahead of the the internet at the same stage uh, in the at, 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 or in the same uh, at the same stage in the adoption curve so if the pace will be will be the same for for the coming years it's going to be a very very interesting uh, trend to watch for sure thank you yeah uh, it looks like from your smile that you uh, you've been holding uh, <laughs> a bit of uh, crypto as well <laughs> yes yes um, Yes, but let's not dive into that too much. But we maybe will have some some crypto episodes in the yeah. future as well. But it's uh, be interesting. it's very interesting to hear that many of the VCs we talk to are are also looking at, at that much more than maybe a few three four years ago. So it's it's becoming it's becoming more and more mainstream uh, in in that sense. So it's it's uh, interesting to see. And also the the automation part is is something we discussed uh, we've discussed as well. It's it's. The um, possibility is there to automate basically anything in terms of content creation also is, is mm. going to change, I think, many companies um, quite a lot in the coming coming years. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's a super exciting time to be a cloud investor uh, in Europe right now. I mean, I, I think meeting every day all these founders and uh, seeing all that energy and, and seeing all the, the great products that are, I mean, Hopefully, a lot of them building on the trend are uh, described, but there are so many other things that are happening right now um, uh, that we didn't have the, the time to, to, to talk about. Uh, so I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen in, in the next year. I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see how, you know, Europe is going to, uh, you know, catch up in terms of volume, uh, you know, compared to, to the U.S. on the IPO front, but also on, on the funding side. And um, yeah, it will, will be interesting to see uh, what's coming next, but I can't be more excited about it. No, for sure. Uh, it's it's going to be really interesting to, to see. And um, yeah, check out the report. We'll, we'll link to, to, to that in the episode description. There's a lot of interesting data points and it's a very positive story for once about, about Europe and its outlooks in, in, in terms of entrepreneurship and startups. So it's, it's a good read in that sense as well. So Absolutely. Called thank you. Thank you. Axel 2021 Euroscape on the path to global dominance. I like that little subtitle there. Very cinematic subtitle. Yes. Very good. So thanks so much for taking the time to, to run through Thank it you so with much. us. Well, thank you, uh, William. Thank you, Zach. It was uh, great, be great being here today. Thanks, thank Philip. You. Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks to everyone who tuned in. See you in the, in the next one. And uh, until then, stay healthy and safe. See you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.